Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 124, featuring the first part of my interview with Jay Barnson, aka Rampant Coyote, the creator of Frayed Knight's Skull of Smackdown. Now, Frayed Knight's is one of the best indie computer role-playing games ever, and it features turn-based combat, which of course you know is a near and dear to me, so it was a real pleasure to get to sit down with Jay and talk all about it. It's over a two-hour long interview, so I've broken it up into 30-minute pieces. In this uh, first piece, we talk about uh, Jay's background, his uh, work on Twisted Metal and Warhawk for the PlayStation, and then start to get into Frayed Knights. Got a lot of great stuff to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jay Barnson. All right, folks, I am here with Jay Barnson, the owner of Rampant Games, industry veteran, Code Monkey, and the man behind Frayed Knights, the skull of SmackDown. And if you haven't played this game, for God's sake, go buy it and play it right now. And then come back and watch the rest of this interview. How are you doing, Jay? Ah, oh, doing all right. How about you, Matt? Doing good. Well, let's talk a little bit about your past. Now, I understand you have some experience uh, with mainstream developers. Can you uh, flesh that out a little bit? Uh, yeah, well, um, yeah, I've kind of been at this for a little while. Uh, I started right out of college, actually, going for a dream job. Uh, I got I got hooked on, you know, I've been playing games since I was, you know, well, since the arcade arcade game days. Um, and uh, when I went to, uh, got out of college, uh, I figured first thing I'd do is try and get a job at a, at a game company. I didn't think I had much of a chance, but I figured I'd give it a try and uh, see what happens and then get a Joe job afterwards, you know, doing whatever. So anyway, I got lucky. I got a couple of uh, job interviews and, and accepted a job at... Uh, a brand new startup called Single Track. That was a bunch of uh, simulator uh, guys from Evans and Sutherland who put together this company, figured they could do games for this brand new platform that no one knew about <clears throat> called the, well, it was like the Sony PSX at the time. It was going to be the Sony PlayStation. And anyway, so it was, uh, I, I got hired on and uh, yeah, you know, I tried to tell people that I was writing games for the Sony PlayStation. Everyone was saying, "Well, is that like the is that like the Sega?" And everybody thought it would tank. You know, Sony. What does Sony know about games? Ah, it'll never go. It's just Ninten Nintendo or, or Sega. And uh, anyway, so I got to work on a couple of projects that were a lot of fun. Uh, initially, I was hired on as a you know to do the PC ports of these games, and uh, they ended up getting me. Uh, have me do the the AI work, a lot of AI work and, and general gameplay and special effects for a couple of games that uh, I'm trying to remember what their their uh, their code names at the time were like Firestorm and Red Mercury, and uh, later they became known as uh, Twisted Metal and uh, Warhawk. And I got to work on both projects simultaneously, so it was great because they were both hit games. They did very well. And, uh, you know, right out of the shoot, one year out of college, I had two hit games under my belt, and they were great. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was exciting times, but it, you know, kind of gave me the <clears throat> first taste of the mainstream industry. Um, and I, uh, you know, did that for a few years, decided I'd, I'd quit, and, and uh, after about what, six years in the industry, quit and, and do something else because I was getting pretty burned out on games. And I wanted to make my own games uh, because when you work in the games industry, you're not making your own games. I mean, it's, you know, you're, you're being told by the publisher, here's what you want to do, here's, here's what you need to do. You know, there's, there's lots of room for creativity and stuff too. Um, but uh, anyway, I did get sucked back into the mainstream industry for a few years, uh, not a little bit a few years ago and got working a little bit more working for a, a great company actually uh ninja b um uh, wahoo studios and got to work on some uh, fun things there and and uh, actually went to work for another company that doesn't exist anymore called sensory sweep where i got to work on the tale of despero which based on the movie which was based on the book and uh anyway got a belly full of the mainstream industry again and uh, left again <laughs> and so and uh, once again to to make sure I was working on my own things my own games and uh, here I am uh, going going indie part-time indie I'm I'm still working uh, working uh, you know 40 hour plus day job and <clears throat> sometimes a 40 hour plus evening job so it's uh, it, it keeps me from being bored <laughs> 
Let's go back a little bit because uh, you mentioned Twisted Metal, and that's one of my one of my favorites. Love that game. So you're saying they just sort of gave you this game and told you to to go make it, or did you have some role in uh, designing it? Uh, you know, that's uh, you know back back then the industry's changed a bit. I think um, since since those days because you know those days we had what was it? Uh, just uh, you could get a, a handful of programmers and a handful of artists, and we had. You know, often I mean, I was working dual role. I was on two teams at once, kind of doing code that worked in both of them. In fact, for a while, Warhawk and Twisted Metal were the same code base. We'd we'd fly the it was called the Peregrine, the ship around the arena, the first arena that you had in uh, in Twisted Metal, where you had the the first one on one battle. Um, anyway, we I was flying around there, and you could shoot the shoot the cars with the with the uh, with the Warhawk ship. And uh, anyway, so but we eventually split the code base. Um, but uh, anyway, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. We uh, but we did have the specs from from Sony. They had a couple of designers, one of whom is still uh, working on Twisted Metal games as well as God of War <laughs> and and so forth. So he's he's gone pretty far and uh, done a lot. Uh, and in fact, I think he's I think he's moved to Utah and he's working up in Salt Lake now. Uh, Dave Jaffe, um, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, you know, when we first had it, we had the design docs, and the design docs had lots of spreadsheets and stuff that were pretty useless when all was said and done, but they did kind of give us an idea of what the, what the designers had in mind. I mean, they'd worked on some other things, too. They'd work on, like, a, a Mickey Mouse game and, uh, you know, some others. Um, but uh, anyway, did Twisted Metal did a Mickey Mouse yes, game. <laughs> they did a Mickey <laughs> Mouse. I, I forget what it was. It was Mickey Mouse. It was for the for the Super Nintendo, I think. Uh, but yeah, they oh, you know, they <laughs> they were quite proud of it. Um, and it was a good game. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it though. I can't now. But uh, you know, they so you, you guys got the got designers there, and they work on. I mean, you you work on whatever you're you're told to work on. Uh, they had several projects, and these were a couple of them. And and uh, so anyway, they they gave us the original design, and we, you know, started out with that design. And our guys kind of fleshed out a lot of the pieces. Um, and then a lot of that gets you know thrown in the dumpster when it's you know two o'clock in the morning, and you're trying to implement the the code. And you know, <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of design meetings, a lot of discussions. You know, uh, sometimes without the Sony guys' involvement, a lot of times with the Sony guys' involvement, and we'd kick stuff over the fence, say, okay, this is what we've got. And in fact, one of the uh, interesting, the, the, the thing in Twisted Metal is, you know, you had the, a lot of these missiles, when you get hit with the missiles, you know, cars would go flying and stuff like that. That was actually a bug. Uh, it was my bug. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, we had a, in Twisted Metal 1, there was like this catapult weapon, which they got rid of in the sequel because no one ever used it. <laughs> so it sounded like a good idea at the time. That's the way a lot of game development works. It sounds good on paper. And uh, <clears throat> you find out later that you just can't, you know, you can outline things, but you can't design fun on paper. That's my opinion. Um, but anyway, there's this catapult weapon. And I had these little signatures. So when a you know, car got hit, you know, what kind of weapon hit it and how much damage it did. And anyway, I had a bug in the code and it was causing any of the major weapons non bullets to to cause the car to go flying like it had been you know hit the catapult weapon and uh anyway so that was on my bug list for like a week or two i guess i had higher priority things game crashing uh stuff like that a little more important but i finally got uh finally got to it and uh and i took it out so cars weren't jumping around anymore when you hit them and so i you know i sent out that that build and and suddenly everyone started complaining they're like what happened the cars quit jumping we loved that and i said well it was a bug <laughs> so they said well we'll put it back in just don't make them jump as much so anyway so we changed it so it was based on damage that we caused them to, you know th there is stuff like that there's a lot of things that had to get cut uh in time there's a lot of things where you just you know you had suggestions from the from the group saying you know, here's here's this idea. Let's try it, and and you know, you have to kind of make those decisions on the spot. So, I mean, game development, I you know, and again, this is my own personal opinion, but I, I think it's it it's the proper way to design. It is iterative. You know, you need a plan. You need that design document because you need you need to start somewhere. And 
but uh, you know, once once you get to a certain stage, uh, as parts of the real game replace the design document, that basically becomes your design document, and you need to you need to play what's on the screen. And sometimes your best ideas come, you know, two o'clock in the morning when you finally implemented something, and everybody you know takes a look at that and says, "Hey, that gives me a great idea. Let's let's do this." So, um, so yeah, it was it was it was very iterative. We had a we had a good time with that one, and. Uh, you know, it was it was one of those things where I, I you know, we didn't know because we were brand, we were all newbies to it. The guys at Sony were the only experienced, you know, veterans, and we only saw them like once a month when they came out. Um, but uh, you know, so we had no clue how it was going to do. You know, as if it was going to sell well or not. And uh, but they, you know, I don't, I don't, we always had kind of a feeling that it was going to be, you know, this, you know, cars and guns. I mean, that's 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 American. You know, that's <laughs> that's great. You know, I was I used to play Car Wars. You know, I, it was great stuff. It was very different from Car Wars, but uh, but you know, yeah, we knew it was we knew it was going to work. So it was uh, we were just very very pleased with with the sales. I'm trying to remember. Is that Twisted Metal one? Did it have the guy in the wheel? No, that was Twisted Metal two. Axel. Axel, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Twisted Metal two, uh, yeah. We, we there's uh, one of the several changes. We had several new cars and and everything there. And yeah, that was that was Axel. I never quite understood. I was only I was only involved a little bit in Twisted Metal two. I was working on Jet Moto at the time. So, um, but uh, so I was only involved in like the initial discussions. And I, you know, I don't know where he came from. But, uh, <laughs> I always wanted one of those wheels, though. Yeah. <laughs> I guess one of the other things is, you know, we had this this turbo that would, you know, kind of shoot a rocket out of the back of the the cars, and uh, well, the back of his car was right out of his butt. <laughs> so for a while, we thought it was hilarious. I think Dave Jaffe got mad. He didn't like the toilet humor in it or something. <laughs> anyway. That would have been awesome. <laughs> so yeah, for a while, when you hit turbo, he had a flame shooting out of his butt to <laughs> make him go flying. <laughs> So, so do you uh, have a favorite between Twisted Metal and Warhawk? You know, uh, it's I actually kind of preferred Warhawk, um, partly because the idea with Warhawk was, at least in my mind, and and that we were, we were given, I think, in a lot of ways, we were given more freedom on Warhawk than you know on Twisted Metal, which you know might not have been a great idea because I think Twisted Metal sold better, but. Uh, the idea with Warhawk, at least when when I was working on it, and there was like I don't know, we had like two programmers working on the game. Uh, you know, we had another couple of guys working on the engine and someone doing sound code. But game code, it was it was just two guys. There was a lead programmer and and me uh, doing double duty uh, most of the time. And uh, what uh, my idea for the game was uh, taking those shooters from the the arcade games, the 2D shooters, you know the the R type and stuff like that, and making it in 3D, which you know, could be done because of the, the PlayStation's capabilities. It was you know, nice. You know, I mean, they had 3D before on the you know Genesis and, and Super NES, especially with the add-on cards and stuff. But uh, this was really you know at the time you know 1994 uh, was was really neat stuff. And uh, anyway, so we, so that was kind of my my guiding guiding focus, and we had a lot of. Uh, we had a lot of interesting stuff that we threw in. I've, I've, we threw in so many Easter eggs and stuff like that. <laughs> there was, there's a couple of things you could do in there where you could get my name to pop up. You know, as uh, if you if you played the game as crazy as I did, you know, which is a heavy reliance on the dumb rockets and stuff like that instead of the guided missiles. Um, the swarm missiles. Everybody loved the swarm missiles in that game. I totally cribbed that from you know watching anime, you know, uh, Robotech and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, I gotta have them do that, and that was my responsibility. So we, I was able to get it in. Um, but uh, we had one where, what was it? If you went in with, it was you had to pick up these canisters of what we called the red mercury. It was this you know miracle MacGuffin thing, and uh, as your as your, you know. To, to finish each level. And uh, anyway, if one of them, whatever canister zero was, if you picked it up while your guns were overheated, you were like out of rockets and you, and you were out of the plasma gun, which you know I had in there because no one ever used the plasma gun. <laughs> anyway, it was actually a really good weapon, but no one knew how to use it. It was a little complicated, so people left it alone. There's a game design uh, 
uh, lesson to be learned there, I think. Um, but um, anyway, if you happen to go with all those parameters and picked it up, uh, it would have a message saying single track rules up at the top of the screen and would upgrade all your weapons to like the super versions that you normally get like in later levels as you picked up so you had a your ship was just out you know loaded for bear with the best stuff and with the super swarmers and and all kinds of stuff anyway we didn't tell sony about this for a while and uh one of the testers accidentally uh, had that happen to him and so he wrote it up as a bug and he's like uh, and he was trying to do his, his repro, and it was clear that he had no clue how this happened. I mean, he was just like, uh, I got this message instead of mission complete. It said single track rules, and, and he tried to describe what he thought he'd done to cause this happen. It was like, no way. Anyway, and we joked around. We were going to send it back to him with a message saying, uh, we can't reproduce this. We figured, okay, that's going to keep that tester off our backs for at least a day <laughs> as he tries to figure out what to do to repro it. But uh, we, we let him off the hook, and we said, okay, yeah, no, that's that's an Easter egg. And, and Sony came back and says, um, you're supposed to tell us all your Easter eggs, please. And so we've got that. And anyway, but we had we had a lot of stuff. We... You know, we we had one part where the bosses in the canyon were named after the the ghosts in um, Pac-Man, and the problem was is their model files were actually named Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde, uh, and that was actually on the the CD. And if you read it in a computer, you could actually see their names. And <clears throat> fortunately, Sony caught that and said, "Oh, you can't call them that." You know, it was only internally that we were calling them that. They were never referred to that in the game. You know, they were you know nameless, but they said, you got to change the names of that because we don't want to get, you know, sued over this. So anyway, so we had a lot of great, uh, great lessons. There's one other a Twisted Metal story that was that was interesting, too. We had a dog that you're supposed to be able to run over. And, uh, you know, Twisted Metal, very violent game. You know, you're shooting people, you're running over people, you know. you're what a you're dog, yeah. There was a dog, and we came across the Sony standards were that you could not cause violence to a realistic looking animal. People were okay. You could blow them away in a bloody mess, decapitate them, no problem, but don't mess with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we was we it were, a cute we, dog or like a ragged mutant dog. It was kind of a ra- no. It, was, it, it wasn't a mutant dog. It was just kind of a stray dog that crossed the street. Uh, it was in the <laughs> second level. Like well, there's old Yeller. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and uh, so we encountered that. I think some tester flagged it that it was a standards problem. Uh, okay, you could you could you could hurt the dog, and we debated about it. We're like, okay, we could probably apply to Sony. You know, I mean, it was a Sony internal game. Uh, technically, I mean, we were the guns for hire to make it um but it was you know sony's game we're like okay we could we could probably petition and they'd change the rules but we're like you know what would be more funny we're just gonna make this dog invulnerable there's no way you can hurt the dog and you know make it a little statement it's like yeah okay yeah people realistic people you can kill them but don't hurt the dog <laughs> well this must have been a huge move uh, i mean working with these teams and all to uh, go to a basically to an indie Indie mode. And I know a lot of people have talked to me about how they like to make a CRPG. You know, they like to make an adventure game, but you know, but you know, a certain part of me was like, why even bother? I mean, how can you compete with people like Bioware and Bethesda and Blizzard? You know, so why did you bother? <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, on on the one hand, I, I could say you you can't uh, you can't compete with them. Um, so don't. Uh, it's one of the you know big lessons. You get a lot of indies out there like, oh, I'm going to make a game. It's just like uh, Halo, you know, but with more weapons and more environments. And you're just like, oh no, dude, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> um, real, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a success. I mean, we got the indie, the whole indie movement is succeeding now, and it's succeeding by making the kinds of games that these big publishers won't. Um, you know, for a while it was the, the casual games, you know, starting with Bejeweled, I guess was the big first success story there. And, um, you know, it was something that the, the mainstream uh, game developers had left behind a long time ago. And, you know, where they where they leave that field open, we're, you know, the indies can move in and seize that territory as they're going off after, you know, bigger and bigger audiences or bigger and bigger mainstream audiences. The funny part is, is in some ways, the indies actually found the the, the bigger ones, uh, you know, casual games. It was like, oh, wait, you know, 50% of the population of the world is female. Hmm, <laughs> I wonder if they might like games. Um, 
and they do. I mean, they like all kinds of games, but there was a lot of games that, you know, the the, the soccer moms and whatnot. They're probably you know, oftentimes they're not so much into you know multiplayer Halo, but something like a you know a game where you're you know finding hidden objects or something like that. They can play the 15 minutes that they've got between all the things they need to do is perfect for them. Um, and uh, the the indies now, I mean, the games that they're coming out with, and and some of my favorite, the indie games. I mean, they're they're stuff that no, I mean, this mainstream studios. You know, I I, I always say mainstream studio, like it's some monolithic thing. I mean, they're they're all different, um, and uh, you know, they they have different approaches, and there's different tiers. I mean, you got the AAA studios, you know, the guys Bioware coming out with their big stuff, and, and you got these other ones, these little. Uh, you know, smaller studios, especially those in Europe, they're all a little bit different. Um, but, you know, so I, you know, I, I overcharacterize them as much as I overcharacterize indies. Um, but, you know, they've, they've got these really big budgets, and it's one of the problems we have now. I mean, you know, back in the day, Richard Garriott was able to make, you know, his first, you know, couple of games pretty much solo, working in his walk in closet. Um, and uh, nowadays, uh, I mean, one of the latest games, you know, the, the last game I worked on, The Tale of Despero, I mean, we had, uh, what was it, six programmers, and I, I, I forget, someone someone else who was there might have the numbers. It was like, you know, uh, another six designers doing level design, and then like another half dozen to a dozen artists and modelers. It's like, you know, this huge team of, of guys, and that costs a lot of money. I mean, most of the expense in these, in these you know, uh, big games are, the budget is in paying the employees. I mean, it gets really pricey, especially if a game is going to go for 18 months um, or more, as is often the case. So, uh, when you're out, you know, putting out that kind of money uh, for a AAA game, I think nowadays, I think it's like a minimum of like six to eight million dollars that you're going to put into it. Uh, I think for AAA, that's you know probably a lot higher than that. But uh, anyway, uh, it's they got to play it safe. I mean, it's it's just business sense. You you know, if you're going to throw that kind of money in there, you want to have a reasonable, you know, chance of of it returning uh, value. So they 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 play it safe. Probably play it too safe because you know I understand uh, you know most mainstream games uh, <laughs> when all is said and done after all the other expenses and marketing, they actually lose money. So there's like you know one or two of these big hits pretty much finance all the ones that barely break even or lose money. Um, so, you know, they, they have to do particular kinds of games, you know, the, you know, first person shooters and, 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 you know, my favorite, the RPGs to, to appeal to the widest possible market. Um, and, uh, indies, you know, we, we have the same sort of concerns. I mean, there's a lot of guys who just do it as a hobby, but, you know, if you're running an indie business, you're probably putting some money into it and uh, you'd like to actually not lose money doing it, at least not too much. Uh, and you know, guys making a living at it. So, so these these are the same sort of realities that indies face. Um, but uh, they do have the luxury with the smaller budgets of being able to experiment uh, a little bit more. And so, you get some of these games that you would never see from a mainstream studio these days. At least not first. I mean, they might copy it later, as has been done a couple of times. <clears throat> a couple. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Indies indies usually don't have the deep legal pockets to defend themselves when, you know, they get completely ripped off. But, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a whole nother story and I'm probably not that qualified to talk about it. But, uh, anyway, but, uh, but that's the whole thing is Indies can, Indies can experiment and they can do things the mainstream studios, you know, literally can't do, uh, because of their budgets, you know, but, you know, they're a public company. Um, they, they got stockholders to answer to and they don't want to get fired. Um, and uh, and that's really what an indie has to do is to say, okay, here's here's something different. I'm not going to compete head to head with the Bioware games, with the uh, Bethesda games. You know, I'm going to do something different. Um, and uh, and what that difference thing is, you know, indie RPGs were practically unheard of five years ago. I mean, you had Spiderweb Software, Jeff Vogel out there doing his thing, uh, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> I mean, he he was indie RPGs. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, I mean, there was a few others, but it was unheard of. And then we started getting stuff like RPGs with a more casual female audience was one of them. Um, 
you had one of the big success stories was uh, uh, Amaranth Games, uh, the Avion. I think it was like the first big breakout um, casual RPG success. And yeah, suddenly found out that, hey, guess what? Women like games, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, you know, there are certain things that they might prefer, again, broad generalizations, but, you know, they like cuter characters and more story centric and stuff like that. But, Hey, they get into the whole grind and beating on monsters and everything, same as everyone else, you know, same as us guys. You know, they don't want the gory blood and guts and everything, and, and uh, sometimes not quite so much minutia or, or uh, so much testosterone, but uh, they, they do enjoy them. And, you know, they went, and suddenly there's this whole category of indie RPGs that are really geared towards women. And I, I think that's awesome. I love it. It's not the games that I make, but... Uh, you know, I'm I'm excited about that, and that's really that's really what indies have to do is figure out a niche and you know figure out a way to thrive there. Yeah, I think they might have missed a missed an opportunity a little bit by calling it indie. You know, I, I keep wondering why, why not market it as fair trade gaming, <laughs> <laughs> gluten free. Uh, you know, try to you know appeal to this whole organic. You know, I mean, there's so many people out there that hate the big corporations. You know, why not you know tap into that. But anyway, let's let's talk about uh, Frayed Knights, uh, the skulls of SmackDown, or the skull of SmackDown. Uh, so you you know you've said you describe this game differently all the time. So so as of this moment, how do you describe uh, this game? Well, uh, it is a I don't know it's a little bit of a hybrid. A large part of it is a throwback to the old school RPGs that I grew up with. Uh, you know, going back to uh, actually one of my big guiding ideas was uh wizardry um seven was actually one that was kind of my in a lot of ways sort of my template but i had bard's tale and might and magic and stuff like that and uh i wanted you know i I wanted to do that and uh and also with a different spin uh because the other part was while i wanted to make something that evoked that old feel uh old school um I, I wanted to do it my own way, and so it's a it's an it's an old school RPG with comedy and uh, you know unique characters, uh, very character based uh, story humor, uh, featuring you know, lots of things that you love. The turn based combat, just like Mother used to make, is kind of the joke I had in the trailer, uh, and uh, turn based combat, party based first person uh, perspective with a a uh, team of of misfit characters who, uh, you know, they are the losers of the adventurer world, and uh, but uh, who who may be the only hope for the uh, for the successful resolution of of whatever is coming up, whatever's killing the seasoned veteran adventurers. So that's 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 my pitch. <laughs> I think you you had me at turn based. <laughs> <laughs> I get that from a lot of people. You know, it's a lost art. <laughs> like, you know, everybody talks about, yeah, I want to make a CRPG. You know, I, I want to do something like this. You actually had the wherewithal to do it. Actually, is completed. You know, so what what did you have that all these other people like me don't <laughs> actually able to uh, get, get this thing to see the light of day? Uh pure obstinance and a lack of common sense i think is probably part of it uh you know i'm not the only one uh, doing games like this um and in fact i just i saw a review uh well it was a review it was talking about the old school rpgs and and it was just talking or it mentioned that uh you know the, it's the new trend you know it's, it's all trendy now to these old school rpgs i'm like what since when i <laughs> want this trend <laughs> um you know, uh, the biggest thing uh, I would say, and I, I had an advantage coming from a background in game development. Uh, you know, I mean, again, I was a I was a code I was a senior code monkey, but I was still <laughs> code monkey. You know, so there's a lot of parts that I didn't have visibility, and I noticed that further I went in the mainstream business, the the more and more like a little cog, uh, you know, I became as the teams got larger your visibility into the whole project and your ability, you know, we talked uh, a few minutes ago about, you know, people being able to contribute to the design and, and Twisted Metal and, uh, you know, those early games. And things have changed a lot. I mean, still, if you work on a, you know, another studio, smaller project, um, you know, you still get that. But the larger the project, the less input each person has and less sense of ownership. Um, 
and uh, the less visibility you get into it. And so there's a lot of things that take place, uh, you know, behind the scenes, and that you know I didn't see as a you know as a as a programmer. But uh, so a lot of this stuff, I, I you know, while I did have some advantage, I had to learn a lot the hard way, uh, just like anyone else. Um, and so uh, it really what I would recommend is not doing what I do, uh, is to start small. I mean, the best way to learn is to, is to do it and to, to start small. And that's probably the biggest problem a lot of people have is that they, they start too big and they have these great big gigantic plans and they get to a certain point and it becomes overwhelming. Usually about the point where they get a really cool looking tech demo and suddenly it goes from making this really cool stuff to actually, you know, making it all work. <laughs> that, that's the hard part. Uh, there's a, there's a statement, a couple of sayings we used to, we used to say in the games business and it applies to a lot of other areas. It's like, you know, the, the 80, 20 rule is the 80% of the job takes 20% of the effort. And, you know, the, the last 20% takes 80% of the effort. And a variation on that I've heard that I liked is, yeah, the first 90% of the project takes 90% of the time. The last 10% of the project takes the other 90% of the time. Um, uh, so really, you know, getting that, uh, getting that stage. When I started with Frayed Nights, it actually started a lot smaller or so I thought. I had to learn some, some tough lessons about scope, and I had to, you know, cut a few things I, I, uh, I really had my heart set on. But... Uh, it's it's really being aggressive aggressive with your scope and keeping it small small enough, and well, <clears throat> Frayed Knights really went out of control, and I violated a whole bunch of my rules for doing that. How many hours of the gameplay does it have? Uh, it's, uh, the testers first time through they take in excess of thirty hours to play through, and when I originally planned it, I, I ended up breaking it up into three chapters. Uh, three acts, which I thought each one was only going to take me five hours. So uh, it was going to be like a 15 hour long game. And I was worried, gee, I don't know. Is this going to be enough gameplay for people to actually want to spend money on it? 15 hours sounds a little short, but I guess that's doable for an indie game. And anyway, and as we got through, you know, and started putting all the stuff in, uh, it's just like, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? <laughs> this is huge. Um, and of course, you know, part of it evolves over time, but um Anyway, so it turned out I'd, I'd really overscoped it, and I had to break it down into you know s smaller bite-sized chunks. Not that 30 plus hours is a bite, but um, anyway, uh, that's that's the first thing is just is just to keep it small, and and that's I think where a lot of people just mess up. And uh, fortunately, I had the the obstinance and stupidity um, to to do it, and I guess probably too much pride. <laughs> I, I I got to a point after I talked about it enough. I'm like, okay, if I don't finish this, I'm gonna have to hide my face in shame. I am never <laughs> gonna be able to be now. on the internet again. Yes, I, you know, I, I, I they're gonna take away my indie card. <laughs> you know, it's, it was uh, it was just fear of fear of embarrassment. I I throwed my hat over the ring, over the or excuse me, throw throw my hat in the ring, throwing it over the fence. It was a joke. Uh, friend of mine, Steve Taylor at Ninja Bee said, you know, you, you throw your hat over the fence, so you have to climb over the fence to get it. You know, that's, you know, part of his scheme. And so, uh, anyway, so I kind of committed myself. And so that fear of humiliation, I think, was, was part of what helped propel me to, to get this thing done. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part two of my interview with Jay Barnson. Also, as always, I want to thank everyone who has been donating and supporting the show. And I want to announce my new initiative or goal, and that is to get to uh, 7,000 subscribers before the end of the year. Still have uh, plenty of time to do it and only about 800 left to go. Uh, so if you have a blog or a forum that you uh, frequent, uh, please uh, post, some of your, post some links to your favorite episodes of Mad Chat and we'll see if we can get that number up to 7,000 and I'll greatly appreciate your help in doing that. And as always, I want to leave you with a quotation, and I think this, quote, this uh, quotation speaks uh, near and dear to everyone who has ever tried to design a game. And it's uh, by a minister, Scottish minister named Oswald Chambers, and it goes something like this. The whole point of getting things done is knowing what to leave undone. See you guys next week. Ooh, I'm really scared. No, don't! Don't! There's a, a peck here with an acorn pointed at me!